Hey again, it's Mr. Lum, and in this Chemistry 11 uh, lesson, we're going to be talking about energy changes in chemical reactions, and um, yeah, so let's get started. Anyways, we have chemical bonds, and these are the bonds that hold molecules together. So there's different types of chemical bonds, like ionic and covalent, but essentially, they are a bond that is difficult to break, and it takes a lot of energy to sometimes break these bonds. And if bonds are broken, a lot of energy has to go into breaking these chemical bonds. So here is an example of a chemical reaction. Now let's just focus on the top part right here of this H2O turning into H and O. And I didn't balance this. and. And we should know by now that H and O are diatomic, so it should be H2 and O2. But let's just kind of focus on this part right here, that H2O is a molecule held together by some covalent bonds. And when it is broken, it takes a lot of energy to go into H2O in order to break the H's from this O, in order to break these apart. So what we see here, uh, now let's take a look at this bottom graph right here. We have H2O, which is a reactant. And what we have to do is we have to add a whole bunch of energy into H2O in order to break it apart. And so since we're adding a whole bunch of energy into it, the products have uh, more energy than the reactants do, uh, did. Okay. Now, the opposite kind of reaction is something like this, where we have like H and O coming together and forming H2O. So, what we can think about this is now H and O are reactants, and they have a whole bunch of this stored potential energy. They have a whole bunch of potential energy stored in there, and in order for them to come together and form this chemical bond right here in order for them to come together and form H2O, they need to lose a lot of that potential energy in order to become a little bit more stable. So they lose a whole bunch of energy and they are able to have, uh, able to form this chemical bond and therefore the products, which in this case right here is now H2O, have a lot less energy. So we're going to break these down into, you know, the ones that gain energy and the ones that lose energy. So here's the second graph that we uh, were talking about in the previous slide. And this type of thing, when we have a reactant that needs to lose a whole bunch of energy in order to form a bond and produce a product, this is called a exothermic reaction. Again, a reaction that releases energy. So like I said before, reactants need to lose a whole bunch of energy to make a bond. And so what we have here is we have reactants are turning into products, and they're releasing a whole bunch of energy in order to make those products. So a reaction that releases energy is called a exothermic reaction. So in exothermic reactions, since the reactants are releasing or losing a whole bunch of energy, the surroundings feel warmer. So we can think of a few different exothermic reactions like paper burning, for example. Um, when paper burns, paper has a whole bunch of chemical potential energy and it releases that energy in order to form the products. When it releases this energy, we feel it as heat energy, and therefore it's exothermic. So you can think of anything that kind of burns like that or gets warmer, like hot packs, those chemical hot packs, they're all exothermic reactions. Now, on the other side of things, there are endothermic reactions. Now, again, this is just pretty much the opposite. This is a reaction that needs, that uh, absorbs a whole bunch of energy. 
So the example that I gave before was H2O needs to turn into uh, H2 and O2. If I was to balance this, it'd be something like this. Okay, so H2O needs to absorb a whole bunch of energy in order to break this H2O bond here and separate it to H and O. So it absorbs a whole bunch of energy, and that's what we see here. The reactants absorbing a whole bunch of energy so they can turn into products. And the equation would be written like this. Reactants plus a bunch of energy are going to turn into products. So if I was to change this, it'd be something like, I'd have to write 60 maybe kilojoules of energy. So 60 kilojoules of energy plus the water is going to be turning into our products. So this would be an example of a uh, endothermic reaction. Now, the surroundings often feel cooler because the reactants are absorbing so much energy to turn into products. Now, there's a few exceptions of this. The surroundings aren't always going to feel colder, uh, but you can think of it as, like, as a, as a chemist, are you putting in a whole bunch of energy into the reaction? So in this particular reaction, this one's a very specific one, how you do it is you would have a glass of water and you would take this and you would hook this up to a, a battery like this. And so in this battery or this, uh, this chemical cell or just, just a regular like kind of a double A battery or something, it's sending electricity into the water and then off of one wire is going to be coming off of uh, oxygen uh, bubbles will be coming off of it and off the other while, wire uh, hydrogen bubbles will be coming off of it. Now it's not going to feel cold, okay, but you have to look at it in this kind of sense of that uh, since I'm adding energy, I'm adding electrical energy into this reaction constantly for this reaction to happen, therefore it's endothermic. Okay? So sometimes it's not always going to, the surroundings will always feel colder, but kind of think about, hey, I have to add constant energy in order for this reaction to occur, and therefore that would make it endothermic. So this one is endothermic, even though it doesn't feel colder. But some examples of times when the surroundings do feel colder is things like when you have those chemical uh, cold packs for sports injuries uh, where you just kind of uh, break something on the inside of this pack and then after a few seconds it gets quite cold. That would be an example of an endothermic reaction where you can really feel how the surroundings are feel, feeling a lot cooler. Now, when I talk about energy, we can almost use this word instead of energy. We can use this word enthalpy. Uh, so energy or potential energy uh, can also be replaced with enthalpy. So the symbol for this is H, and the change in enthalpy is delta H, or this triangle H, which and triangle means delta. And whenever you see this in math or science, uh, this symbol, this triangle symbol, uh, delta, will often mean change. So if you had a change in time, or a change in mass, or whatever, it'll often have like this triangle in front of it. So we have a change in enthalpy right here. And how we calculate change in enthalpy is we just take the enthalpy of the products and we minus the enthalpy of reactants. So the enthalpy of the products, in this case right here, is, well, we just find uh, this number right here. I guess this arrow should probably come down a little bit further, right to there. And let's pretend, oh, this number is about 40 kilojoules. So our delta H, going to equal 40 
kilojoules, and that is for our products right here, minus the reactants. So the re reactants look to be about 100, so minus 100 right here. And therefore, delta H is going to equal negative 60 for this particular graph right here. So in all, in all exothermic reactions, this one is an exothermic reaction because it's losing energy, all exothermic reactions have a delta H that is negative. Okay? So all exothermic have a negative uh, delta H. Okay? They are all, all exothermic reactions uh, will have a delta H that is negative. All exothermic rea reactions are going to have graphs that go down like this. All exothermic reactions are going to be reactants make products. And then energy, I'll just do a big E like this, energy will always be on the product side. Okay, so these are three different things that you can see for all exothermic reactions. Now for endothermic reactions, I'm kind of running out of space, but for endothermic, it's almost the opposite. Instead of delta H will always be positive because the graph is going to go up. And if I was to take this number, which is our H products, minus our H reactants down here, since this number is a bigger number, minus this one, it'll, delta H will always be positive for endothermic reactions. And instead of having your energy on the product side for exothermic, energy, again I'll do a big E, energy plus reactants, just short of react, will make products. Okay, so these are the three big things for all endothermic reactions, and these are the three important things to understand for all exothermic reactions.